On today's episode, we speak with the head of CBN Israel's Victims of Terror Department. Having led the department for years, the events of October 7th brought unprecedented challenges, both in her personal life and in the demands of her work. As she faced the chaos and trauma of that day, her role became more intense and crucial than ever before. Please welcome Alice Mizrahi. So I'm here today with Alice Mizrahi, yeah, um, who is the head of the CBN Israel Victims of Terror Department. Yep. What a name. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... A name yeah. that comes with a job. <laughs> yeah, it kind of explains what you do, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, But how long have you been in the position? Uh, I've been in CBN total for six years, and that position for four. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I am wondering, because, you know, everybody in Israel, like, we now talk about, like, October 7th. Like, there was before October 7th, yeah. and then there's after. So yeah. what was your job like before October 7th? Well, well, let's say that half of my colleagues are either um, evacuated and are not back uh, to work. Uh, from that half, some people are dead and are no longer with us. Um, people that I used to work with fluently, daily. Some kidnapped. Some have kidnapped relatives. And basically, it's a total chaos. It was very um floating and you know we had a we had our work going on we had things going on we had the people that you know I needed financials I go there I needed individual aid I go there I needed big projects I go there I had all that thing going on and all the system you know that we've built for this yeah. past four years and uh on the 7th of October everything was just destroyed it took forever to even be back uh, to some level of systematic work with them, it's still not 100%. I would say it's 30%. And But the job, it's like, didn't triple and didn't, it, it's, I don't know, it's, it keeps on coming. And yeah, it's, it's exponential. It's exponential, yeah. yeah. And, and so much more than it used to be before. Yeah, like, so for instance, what, like, before October 7th, I mean, terrorism terrorism, yeah. whether it hits yeah. one person or, like, on that day, you yeah. know, thousands. But uh, what did you do before? Like, like was it individual cases? Was yeah. it, like, what was the focus of your work before? Well, we had a few um, focuses we had. First one was that we did big projects, mm -hmm. um, one-time projects, you know, for the community, mostly community projects that would... The entire community would benefit from uh, and to actually work on the resilience of the people mm -hmm. and th these communities are families and for them having community events is is better than a psychological treatment in a way so we did a lot of that uh, we also worked the Re resilience center uh, and provided psychological treatment for children mm -hmm. and adults uh, in the Gaza envelope and Zderot. And we had a lot of individual aid also okay. for people who were living in Zderot or uh, Ashkelon or uh, the Gaza envelope. So what is, I mean, for people who are listening from outside, you know, Israel and they, uh, obviously Israel makes headlines yeah. with, uh, you know, wars and acts of terrorism and stuff. But uh, can you give us a little background about um why it, there even needs to be a department and a new humanitarian aid organization, yeah. why there needs to be a department that's specific to terrorism? Wow. <laughs> well, if you go back, I don't think there is a single year since Israel was born as a state uh, that there hasn't been terror attacks. Uh, we've been constantly bombed, stabbed, uh, attacked, uh, together with all the wars that we've had since '48. Uh, we also had many intifadas, which are like uprising, or, yeah, uprising mm -hmm. terrorism that just yep. you know goes everywhere, and and yeah, and just daily stabbings or like explosions or stuff that were going on in Jerusalem, mostly in Jerusalem mm -hmm. uh, and the old city area, but also like in the in the center of Israel. I don't think that I've ever went through a year in Israel that there hasn't been any terror attacks or uh, rockets mm -hmm. fired from Gaza to Israel. It's been going on for 24 years already now. So 
nonstop, constantly. And we've had all those operations that would kind of stop them for a while. But then we never really eliminated the problem. It was just there all the time. So the people of Zderot and the people of Otef uh, Aza, which is the Gaza envelope, have been suffering under the hand of Hamas for the last 24 years mm -hmm. with constant bombing, constant. So there's your answer why oh, we need wow. a terrorist, yeah, and, uh, victims of terrorism department in Israel. Yeah. So anyway, so October 7th, then yeah. let's all bring us to October 7th. And uh, what, first of all, it's not just that your whole department change or everything that you had to do for work, yeah. but uh, what was happening with you personally? Well, on October 7th, my husband was uh, recruited, like I think all Israeli men that are recruit soldiers. Um, and I was left alone with my kids. Um, we don't have a bomb shelter, so I had to move to my parents' house. And sometimes my parents, sometimes my sister-in-law, because none of our relatives that live in Israel have a bomb shelter. So it wasn't safer for me to live there. It was just that I have two kids and I'm one, so I needed another pair of hands to help me lift my kids when there was sirens and go down to the bomb shelters, the, the, the bomb shelter, the, the building bomb shelter, you know, the public one. Um, so yeah, and basically lived in my car. I don't think I actually functioned very much on the first few weeks of the war. You know, it, it was like, a, like a Shiva, you know, after in the Jewish tradition, when somebody dies, then you have this week that everyone is coming to, mm -hmm. you know, help you cope with that new phase in your life. So I think the first few weeks were like Shiva, you know, that I was, trying to, you know, swallow that unbelievable, unreal situation in my life. And uh, also I was so sleep deprived because my kids just stopped sleeping well because of all everything that happened, you know, them moving from three homes all the time. And my husband was recruited, so he wasn't around. And he was also, he, he didn't have a phone, so mm -hmm. we couldn't have uh, been too much contact and my, my brother actually went into Gaza uh, on October 7th already so uh, yeah so it was a lot of stress and tension mm -hmm. I was trying to work I was trying to do my best but if I look back it's just like a fog you know I think I went on autopilot and just mm -hmm. went on and <laughs> that's it and so the kids didn't have any daycare right. uh, routine anymore because their daycares didn't have bomb shelters. Well, and also tell us about your city. Uh, oh, what? yeah. Well, Rishon LeZion was actually the third most bomb city. Right. And the war, that's, it's a surprise. Right. It's, it's a shock because I live in the center of Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rishon got some rockets here and there in the previous operations, but, you know, nothing serious. It was like two bombs a day. But here it was like constant, constant bombing. And actually the first rocket that fell in Rishon LeZion was 100 meters from my house. Like 6.30 in the morning, we were running down the stairs and the door just slammed behind us. And I was screaming to my husband like, it's right there, it's right here on the street, it's here, it's here. And I was so... You know, it was so loud. I've never been so close oh to gosh. a falling rocket, you yeah. know. It was the first time for me. And I, I felt like the entire building is just going to fall down. And when we went up after, like, I think 30 minutes, because the bombing was constant. Like, one siren after another, after another, after another. And we couldn't look at the news. There was nothing on the news. And we don't have also a good uh, cell reception in the bomb shelter uh -huh. underground. So... We were trying to refresh and see what's happening and it's just like cooking show on on the main Israeli channel. And we're like, what is that? I mean, it's been going on and off the sirens for like 30 minutes and nothing ever, nowhere, you know. And so after it came down for a while, you know, we stayed in the bomb shelter for another 10 minutes. It was quiet and we went up and, you know, right. I just entered my apartment and I see the window here and I just see all this fire. And I was like, well, here's the wow. thing that I felt. And the funny thing is that on the, the next Saturday after the 7th of October, it's my uh, oldest kid birthday. And we had to do his birthday in a Kajimbori. It's like a playground for yeah. kids. And we invited all those friends. 
And the next rocket that fell in Rishon Etzion fell on that place, on that playground thing. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so odd. Uh, so Wait, I was like... Before the party? Like Yeah, yeah. It was like on the 7th of October. Oh, on the 7th. The party was supposed to be on the 14th oh, wouldn't have or been, 13th. They probably would have canceled it though. Yeah, I know. But like, oh it's my just... Gosh. I was like, what are the odds, you know, yeah. that it would just go oh, there? Oh my goodness. So yeah. So wow. it was just an insane day, an insane period of time. Yeah. Which is not over yet, by the way. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. and we're going to get to that. Yeah. But so Iron Dome, so for those who don't know, mm -hmm. Israel has this amazing anti-missile defense yeah. system called the Iron Dome, and it, yeah. it shoots down a very high percentage yeah. of the rockets. But I guess when there are thousands coming and they, yeah. even if it misses 10%, you know, that's still a hundred rockets, yeah. you know, of a thousand, you know, um, so. That was insane. Is it? Or did I do the math yeah, right? Yeah, anyway. Did. Did. Yeah, so. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's, that's why for the most part, you don't, like in Israel, you don't necessarily worry about a couple rockets here and there because Iron Dome gets them. But yeah. then when there's thousands, which there was that morning. Yeah. All right. So this then completely changed. Of course, you had your personal situation, but yeah. it also completely changed how your work was going to, how you're going to approach your work now. Yeah. Because suddenly your victims of terror were many more. Yeah. And also it affected communities. It, it probably affected the most communities that you already work with. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So tell us about like um, why, and you were already like in the South and the South is, is what was hardest hit. First of all, I think that one amazing thing that happened is for that the entire office became the managers of victims of terrorism department because the amount of people that got um, affected by this, you know, the entire Gaza envelope, this Derot, Ash Ashkelon, these are, uh, especially this Derot and Ashkelon, these are cities, you know, there's yeah. big cities with thousands, tens of thousands of, of citizens and all these people had to be evacuated and, and had to have a plan and the government had no plan <laughs> On the 8th of October, everybody was, I mean, there were still terrorists running around Ashkelon and and Souther. On, on yeah. the 8th, 9th, 10th, we, we kept on finding them yeah. constantly everywhere. We didn't even have like a correct number of people that went in. So we didn't know the situation and we were like, well, how, how are we going to help now, you know? And uh, so I think everyone in the office dropped everything they're doing and just started uh, to, to support me and my department and all the people uh, that needed our help because I literally got phone calls on the 7th from people that we are helping that are under our care in CBN, in Sderot and, and, and the Gaza envelope, asking me to call the police to tell them that there are um, terrorists in their backyard. And I called because I didn't even realize it was a quarter, it was, it was like five minutes to seven and I think that the news went on, it's like 7.15 yeah. a.m. Yeah. And it's like 20 minutes even before the news went on and we even realized what's going on. I already had people that we that we helped in the past that had my phone number that went and said, please call someone. There are terrorists everywhere. My best friend from Kfar Aza wrote us in our military res reserve group, please come with your weapons because we have some people in our reserve group that carry a gun. Just, just take every weapon you have and just come rescue oh us. Oh my gosh. No one is here. And it was just such a chaotic situation. And so we, we, we needed everyone on board yeah. for the victims of terrorism department. Yeah. And that's what we did. Yeah. And we did mostly big, big, major community projects, which are, you know, buses and having people evacuate to hotels, having food trucks and stuff like that to support them, mm -hmm. bring them clothes. Yeah, uh, food vouchers, stuff that will just, no one knew it's going to last for so long, Nicole. We all thought, like, we had this exper experience with so many military operations. And we we're like, well, one month tops. And there you go. We're nine months in. Right, right, right. So, at, and at the beginning, it was, like, it was, it was chaotic. Yeah. I mean, people, and Yet, nine months later, some of your people that you evacuated yeah. that we saw in hotels and, you know, there were, we had some programs going on. Yeah. CBN Israel sponsored some events at hotels. and um, But some of them, many of them, yeah. are still evacuated. Yeah, yeah. Nine months later. Yeah. 
and have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And there is no plan for them. And the government actually extended their stay until December. And it was for sep September, by the way. Now it's all over again. It's December. And it's unbelievable. It's I don't even know how you live mm -hmm. with your kids and, and your entire family in a 25-meter room in a hotel in a city that is far, far away from your home and everything you knew. And how, you know, and, and it's just unbelievable. Yeah. You know, I'm always um, interested. You, you've you said a lot about uh, trauma, yeah. that your people that you're in touch with and, and that you've been helping, it's, they used to be the, you know, like your, your contacts to help the, the wider um, audience, let's say, yeah. but they themselves are in trauma while treating their people who are in trauma. So I, I mean, can you talk to us a little bit about what kind of trauma you're seeing here. And also you had said something interesting um, that uh, we're not even in post-trauma, we're yeah. still in trauma. So can you explain that? One of the things that was most significant about this time is that a lot of kids had a regression in their behavior, even in peeing in bed, taking back a pacifier, uh, getting a bottle, you know, stuff mm -hmm. that they were way past them. And a lot of that came back. Also, adults started peeing themselves, which is insane. Wow. But I mean, I can't imagine myself now being 32 years old, peeing myself in bed. But I can't imagine also being locked in a, a bomb shelter in my, inside my house and having terrorists outside mm -hmm. trying to burn it, you know. And, yeah. and, and so, you know, one of the things that psychology is talking about, uh, about trauma and helping you cope with trauma is going back home. Going back home is 50% of the job. A lot of kids and, and teenagers started uh, doing drugs, smoking, drinking alcohol. These are proven statistics that have been, um, people have been researching that in the last nine months. And some of the researchers researches have been published lately. And you can see that so many kids, poor kids had COVID, and couldn't even, you know, recover from COVID. Right. And then you go again from for online school, from being um, away from your friends, mm -hmm. family. Those things are um, first aid trauma treatment is being around your people, around your family, inside your home. And that's your safe place, especially for children. Children are so good with coping with trauma once they are... Um, in the familiar place with the familiar people, with their caregivers, you know, that they have a safe attachment to. And, and, and that, that helps them go on. And they don't have that. And that's why I'm saying people are still in trauma. Mm -hmm. Resilience centers are collapsing. There are no, n not enough psychologists or social workers to treat the people because the psychologists are in trauma. And those psychologists need psychologists. And so that's this evil cycle, you know, of, of things that are happening. And a lot of people that used to work in the resilience center in the Gaza envelope or Zderot are still evacuated or they're in a deep depression and the post-traumatic, you know, some post-traumatic symptoms and, and stuff like that. And some people's people didn't even change their pajamas. You know, they're still in their pajama in their hotel room nine months later. So what the, the psychological world in Israel is saying is that we're still in the trauma because mm -hmm. soldiers are still dying. We are still in an unknown situation for the entire North and the entire South. And people, some kibbutzim had permission to go back. But if you visit those kibbutzim and you hear how loud it is in there because the Air Force is bombing, the artillery is bombing, tanks are bombing. There's still war in Gaza. Yeah. And it's right there. Their windows are like, you know, I've been there. It's unbelievable. You can't sleep, you know? And so it's just all together, people can't really start healing. So it's like a catch 22. It's like you'd be better off at home, but home is still doesn't sound great. Like, yeah. you know, it just feels like unstable. But it's unbelievable how people are still preferring to go back home 
Mm -hmm. And it feels safer for them. Not all of them, of course. Some people are saying they will never, ever return to that place. They will never, ever live there. And I'm not judging them. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I would do. No one knows. Right. But some people are just like, I just need my home. I just need my bed. I need my stuff. Yeah. I need my life. You know, I just need that. And, and, and that's the majority. The majority needs that familiar place. What are the, um, the requirements of the government? I, I, they have mentioned, and you've mentioned, like regarding some of your projects, that there needs to be certain things in place, like public transportation, education. Yeah. Like what are the requirements for people to choose to move back home? For now, some kibbutzim have, have had the permission to go back, but then they don't have a school. Okay. No daycares. That doesn't help. So yeah, yeah. So like, okay, let's go back. But uh-huh. what now? So that's why a lot of the elderly have gone back. Yeah. But not the families. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Nevesh Kol is one of the facilities that we are supporting. Yeah. It's the el- elderly house in, in Nevesh Kol. And they came back, but they have some, um, some, like, matefet, how you say that? Like, uh, uh, um... Like uh, a, enveloping um, support, yeah, some support, structure, structure. Um, wow, something that's a that tough helps word. them, yeah, that helps them to to cope with that, yeah. you know. And they have all those activities that they're doing, yeah. And so, but with a family with kids, you need schools, daycares, you need to go back to work. So, what do you do with your kids? I will never leave my kids unsupervised, you know. Yeah. So. So now what the Gaza Envelope people are trying to do is actually to rebuild a new school in Kibbutz Gbulot. Mm -hmm. And they are actually raising support for that. They need a lot of bomb shelters. They need buses with bulletproof windows. They need security guards that will um, have them escorted on the buses. The teachers that are willing to go back, Uh you know. Um, The school needs, needs fixing. Okay. So many things, you know. So they are trying to to bring back the community, but what will bring back the community is is to show them that we are trying to go back to normal, mm-hmm. you know. And here are some lifelines for you. Here's a school. Here's a daycare. Here's a grocery shop that's opening. Come back. So what is CBN Israel doing to help this return to normalcy? We have so many projects uh, going on, and we're work- working with the kibbutzim to see what they need Mm -hmm. um we are working with the resilience center to find out uh how a financial plan will will work regarding the school Mm -hmm. and the bomb shelters Mm -hmm. we're focused on bomb shelters right now uh to see how much they how many bomb shelters they need for for at least a thousand kids to go back um yeah so we have all those open options Mm -hmm. we are still it also depends on them because they need some permits from the government. So it's like a back and forth uh, situation, but we are still going on. My department still goes on with individual aid, yeah. supporting resilience uh, centers, supporting the uh, elderly center, supporting the youth center, and supporting the entire area, with mm-hmm. even with a lot of also individual aid because people need help with furniture, electric devices and so on. Uh, one of the projects that uh, that we got the opportunity to film and to, you know, see your work, your final product was bomb shelters, actually, yeah. but in Rishon Lezion. Um, so tell tell me about that. What is this? This absolutely fascinated me. What goes into making a bomb shelter? We work with a company called Red Mix. They're a huge cement company in Israel, and they have this amazing system of uh, special cement that actually dries up pretty fast. But uh, the making is not the problem. <laughs> the, getting the permits to put them there. Oh, my gosh. And that was, I mean, every mine that I could step on, I did step on. I stepped on because it's just... You know, I just also realized how much the cities in the center are not prepared yeah. for anything like that. You know, I've never had any problems installing bomb shelters anywhere in the north or in the south. I just said the B in bomb shelter. Mm-hmm. People jumped at me. It's like, oh, my gosh, thank you. Everything you give is like great. But then it was just like all these obstacles, you know, 
and it took months to have all that permits and the bomb shelters being made and have the bomb shelters being custom made because the regular bomb shelters, they have different sizes that are, you know, that have the permission of the um, minister of... Defense? No, like Pikuda Oref. It's... Um, home front command. Home front command, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make a custom bomb shelter that the home front command will approve and then it can go to making and then you can deliver that. And it took forever. Wow. And eventually, praise God, it went, it, it yeah. actually happened. And kids of like, I think more than 120 families could go back to life. Yeah. And those kids are, I'm talking about babies. It's like right. four months to three years. Right. And you go, obviously you need daycare for that. But so the, you were telling me though, also that uh, they have to approve it. The home front command approves it because the missiles that can reach yeah. that city are different than the miss missiles that reach Gaza. So it required a different construction, right? Yeah. 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 The thickness it's of the walls has to be different. If in the Gaza envelope, it's like 30 centimeters, I think. Mm -hmm. The thickness in here was like 40 something. Oh my gosh. That's the it. ceiling had to be doubled. Like in the Gaza, it's like 20 centimeters. It was 40. Wow. Different doors, different windows. Everything had to be different. Because again, when you fire a missile 80 kilometers from the border, obviously it's a one hell of a missile. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, and it's for kids. Right. That's the most important thing. You know, the Home Front Command takes it very seriously. Yeah. Everything regarding to children. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a, quite a ride, but you've seen the final part. Right, I saw <laughs> it. It was, yeah, that was unbelievable. Um, before we started recording, you were comparing the situation here in Israel to Ukraine. Yeah, first of all, I'm Ukrainian. And the war in Ukraine hit me, you know, just a Friday morning, I remember, in February. I woke up to like 500 phone calls that were unanswered because it was like five in the morning. And uh, it was my mom and my dad and my family from Ukraine calling us, uh, telling us that Russia invaded Ukraine. And I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. And I remember sitting in front of the TV crying and I'm just, and, and it's, and that's it, you know? And the world does nothing. Here's Ukraine living peacefully. And here's Russia, a huge state, just, just deciding one day to invade Ukraine and kill everyone, and that's it, you know? And, and, and here is Israel, living its life, being sometimes bombed by Gaza, but we kind of came to peace with it, you know? Which is terrible, but... Right. And there is just the Nukba terrorists deciding to invade Israel and kill everyone and rape and burn everyone on the way. And... One of the biggest things is that, first of all, Ukraine stands alone against Russia and Israel stands alone against Hamas and Hezbollah. And uh, the more the time goes by, people just forget and it becomes normal. But for us, it's not normal. Nothing here is normal, Nicole. Nothing. My husband is a reserve soldier the third time. And it's not only my husband. All reserve soldiers. Some soldiers have been serving for nine months. So in Ukraine, imagine, it's already almost three years. People haven't been home for almost three years. And here we are, nine months in, we never thought it's going to take that long. We are being bombed constantly. Nothing is being done about it. The world is silent. Ukraine, Israel, you know, and, and that's it. And so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's not over. We're still living yeah, it. Yeah. And it means you still have a lot of work. Yeah. And it's very important for me that people will understand around the world, watching the, this podcast, listening to this podcast, we are not over. We are still losing soldiers every single day. You know, people are still evacuated. There's still war, sirens. It's a chaos. It's a financial chaos. It's a security chaos. Everything is chaos. And yeah, so I want people to know that. Well, Alice, I, you have given us such a picture of what what's going on here, both from a professional level, but also a personal level. And really all the aspects that people don't think about 
and also a lot of very interesting details um, and facts on the ground. And it's always, literally, it's always fun to talk to you. <laughs> um, it, um, but thank you so much for thank being you. with us and for explaining everything. Thank you for doing this. And, no, thank you. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. Make sure to subscribe, like, and leave a comment. With your support, we'll be able to continue to provide more interesting and educational conversations in the future. See you next time.